If you have your Bibles, open them up to uh, the Gospel of Luke chapter 2. That's where we're going to go today. Um, and I, I want to just point out that we actually do have lights for you today. So you can see your Bibles for those of you who you know, may have some uh, frustrations with that. Um, uh, today we have it for you. So open your Bibles to Luke chapter 2. Uh, and we're going we're gonna to dive into the Christmas story together. While you're getting there, let me give you um, just a little bit of housekeeping instructions because I don't want to forget. Uh, at the end of service, we're going to light candles and we're going to sing Silent Night together. And because this is unfamiliar territory for us, we don't do it that often. I want to just kind of remind you how this should work. So we're going to pass the, the light around the room um, from one candle to the next. But if your candle is lit, it needs to stay vertical. And the candle that is unlit needs to tilt and come toward you, okay? That's the way that you keep wax from getting all over you and your family and the chair and everything else, right? So just, I just want to say that now because I know I might forget later. Luke chapter 2, starting at verse 1. In those days, Caesar Augustus issued a decree that a census should be taken of the entire Roman world. This was the first census that took place while Quirinius was governor of Syria. And everyone went to their own town to register. So Joseph also went up from the town of Nazareth into Galilee to Judea to Bethlehem, the town of David, because he belonged to the house and the line of David. He went there to register with Mary, who was pledged to be married to him and was expecting a child. While they were there, the time came for the baby to be born, and she gave birth to her firstborn, a son. She wrapped him in cloths and placed him in a manger because there was no guest room available for them. Let me just pause there for a moment and, and let's just let that sink in. Like, like just, just absorb what we just read. This, what, I, what I love about the Christmas story is that it's, it's too kind of off the wall to actually make this up. And we, all, we also have like, like, like historical evidence here, right? Like we're talking about something that happened in, re, in a real time, in a real place. It starts with this, this decree Caesar Augustus issued of, of a census of the entire Roman world. So we can literally go back in, in, in world history and look at that and see that unfolding in the first century. And then beyond that, this, this just gets so complicated and so messy. So let, let me just say, like if you were going to make up a story about the birth of a Messiah that you wanted the whole world to believe in, you would not start the story this way. Like if you, if you were going to make up a story about the King of Kings, the Lord of Lords, the Messiah that you wanted everybody in the world to bow down and worship to, it would not start with, with this, this family who had to travel in, into this kind of remote, obscure town that nobody really cared about, nobody knew anything about. Like it was Bethlehem, and, and yeah, they knew that it was where, where King David had been born, but otherwise it was insignificant in every way. And then on top of that, this, this, this family, like they were pregnant and, and there's a whole backstory there of, of Mary receiving this, this incredible message from the angel Gabriel that, that she was going to be with child and it was going to be conceived by the Holy Spirit and then, and then Joseph not believing her and then that whole situation being complicated and messy. Like you would not make that story up. The only reason why you would tell that story is if it were true. And one of my favorite things about the, the story of the birth of Christ is that it, it's just so messy. It's so messy. It's so complicated. It's so messy. I mean, just, just think about this. So, so you have Mary and Joseph. They are most likely in some level of poverty. They have no influence. She's pregnant. And then, and then they live underneath of the oppressive Roman regime that's Whatever they say goes. Like, whatever they tell you to do, you have to do. It doesn't matter. It doesn't matter that she was ready to have this baby at any moment. They had to travel because the decree was issued. And so they have to take this journey from Nazareth to Bethlehem. And then when they get there, think about how messy this is. Like, this is his hometown. You would think his, his soon-to-be wife, who is, is carrying this child, you would think somebody would say, we've got some room for you. We're going to make room for you. And yeah, now, I get it. I get that there are all sorts of, of people coming back into town, and it's a small town, and that everybody's coming back because they have to. They don't have a choice in the matter. But still, there is no room for them whatsoever. So, so they end up having to give birth to this, this child, the Son of God, the, the Messiah, the Savior of the world. 
and, and lay him in a manger of all places. In a manger, a feeding trough, like where animals eat out of. That is not the story that you would think of for the entrance of the Son of God. That's not the story you would think of for the entrance of a mighty king, yet that's how God chose to enter the world. And, and here's the tension that we all feel. Christmas time, we all, we all have this longing within us for Christmas time to be picture perfect. Every single one of us, we, we, like, we have these, these hopes and, and these desires and this anticipation for everything to be just right. For everything to just, just work out exactly like we hope. Like we, we kind of play it up in our minds and we dream about it and we have these hopes. And, and especially those of us with, with kids, like we just want it to be this, this completely perfect experience. And yet the reality is for all of us, it's always a little bit messy. Like for, for every single one of us, Christmas is messy. Like no, no matter what your situation is, everybody in here, you have some sort of mess in your family. Like, like there's a family member that's difficult to be around. And if you're sitting here, you're going, no, we don't have that. Guess what? You're the family member that's difficult to be around. Like you are the one. That's you. And that means you're messy. We all have it. We all have challenges and, and, and we all have these, these hopes that just kind of get unfulfilled in, in different ways. So we, we have this tradition in my family that I've grown to love. Uh, every year in the Christmas season, before Christmas Day, we find a night to go over to Franke Park and drive around the park looking at the Blue Jacket fantasy of lights. Anybody else do this with your family? Anybody else? Okay, all right. A lot of people in here know what I'm talking about. So this is one of our traditions, and I always look forward to this tradition. I would say we always look forward to this tradition, but I don't think my wife does look forward to the tradition, and I'm not sure my kids look forward to the tradition. But for for me, it's like this, because I remember when I was a kid, we did that, and so I want my kids to have that same experience. I I want it to be magical for them. and, And so anyway, this year we had all these expectations, and at least I did, you know, uh, that this was going to happen, and, and then things kept happening. We had sick, sick kids, and, and then stuff comes up, and schedules get rearranged, and the night that we were going to do it got rescheduled multiple times, and finally we're like, I, I just don't think this is going to happen. I was, I was really disappointed. And so then it, it came down to the wire, and on Thursday night, you know, this, this crazy storm that was getting ready to roll in, we're like, man, this is, the, this is the only night left for us. We've got other things going on the rest of the week, so this is the only night left for us to make this happen. So we decided we're going to give it a try, and we're going to beat the storm. So we go out there, and it's raining at this point, but that's fine. You know, it wasn't freezing rain yet. And so we, we get over to Frankie Park, and we drive through, and, and we take my littlest one, who's almost two, and we actually take her out of her car seat and, and sit her up front. You know, we're holding her on our lap so that, you know, it's, uh, all right, if there are any police in here, just pretend like you didn't hear that, okay? But, but anyway, so we're, we're, we're driving around the park, and we're, we're looking at the lights, and she's in awe. I mean, it's just this, for me, I'm like, yes, this is it. Like, this is the moment. We're having that experience that I wanted, like this picture-perfect experience. And then my, my other two in the back, they end up getting in a fight about halfway through over something stupid, right? You know, like I don't even know what it was. Probably about like whether the snowball that, that the lights were throwing hit one of them or the other one. I don't know. Like my kids, do your kids fight over things that aren't even real? Anybody else or is that just me? So they get in a fight at one point. And, and, but, but still, it's, it's okay. We're moving past. And, and we get all the way through the lights and have this, this great experience together. And then we... Get ready to leave, so we go put her back in her car seat. And then we pull out, and we're not even two minutes down the road. And then my wife and I, at the same time, we hear the sound that every parent never wants to hear. And I know a lot of you have, like, dinner plans later on, so I'm not going to go into too much detail. But I will just say that there was food that was consumed earlier that day, and that food made its way back out. It was no fun. And I will just tell you right now, it was not picture perfect at all. And so we, we go home, and, and I'm, I'm just sitting there, like, thinking, like, man, I, I wanted this so bad. Like, I just wanted us to have this experience so bad. And, the, and it just did not at all go like I thought it would. Didn't turn out at all like I hoped. And, and it's really not a memory that I want to hold on to, you know? Like, maybe 10 years from now, we'll look back and be like, oh, remember that? That was so crazy and kind of fun. No, it wasn't fun. It wasn't. And, and all of us, we, we have that, right? Like, every year we have that, where we have these expectations and then, and then just... Stuff comes up, and life doesn't go the way we expected it to. But here's what I love about the Christmas story. Jesus didn't come in this picture-perfect way. He came in a, in a very humble way, a messy way, a way that, that enters into the brokenness 
and the confusion and the chaos of the world that we all find ourselves in. That's the way that the Son of God decided to enter into the world. It's real life. It's real life. And that's the way Jesus came. Let's go back to the text. Pick it up again at verse 8. And there were shepherds living out in the fields nearby, keeping watch over their flocks at night. An angel of the Lord appeared to them, and the glory of the Lord shone around them, and they were terrified. But the angel said to them, do not be afraid. I bring you good news that will cause great joy, listen to this, for all the people. Today in the town of David, a Savior has been born to you. He is the Messiah, the Lord. This will be a sign to you. You will find a baby wrapped in cloths and lying in a manger. Suddenly, a great company of the heavenly host appeared with the angel, praising God and saying, Glory to God in the highest heaven and on earth peace on those on whom his favor rests. When the angels had left them and gone into heaven, the shepherds said to one another, Let's go to Bethlehem and see this thing that has happened which the Lord has told us about. So they hurried off and found Mary and Joseph and the baby who was lying in the manger. When they had seen him, they spread the word concerning what had been told them about this child. And all who heard it were amazed at what the shepherds said to them. But Mary treasured up all these things and pondered them in her heart. The shepherds returned glorifying and praising God for all the things they had heard and seen, which were just as they had been told. So, as we've already discovered, the, the story is messy, but one of my other favorite things about this Christmas story is that the birth, birth of Christ is for everybody. Like, for everybody. Like, th think about this. Like, the first people who get invited into the Christmas story, the first people who get invited to Christmas, the first people who get to experience the birth of Christ are shepherds. And now what you may or may not know about shepherds is that in the first century world, they were a despised class of people. They were considered poor, dirty, and outcasts. They were actually considered untrustworthy, so much so that they were not allowed to testify in a court of law because their testimony wouldn't have been considered valid because they were just very dishonest people, or at least that's what people thought about them. They were considered unclean because they were always covered in filth, spending time out with the animals. So therefore, they weren't allowed to, or, or able to uh, observe the ceremonial laws and therefore couldn't have ever entered into the temple. They were outcasts. They were a despised class of people. And that's the first people that were invited into this Christmas story. It's for everybody. The birth of Christ is for everybody. The, the, the incarnation. God coming to earth is for everybody. Jesus is for everyone. He came for each and every one of us. And he demonstrates that intentionally by having these angels. Just, just imagine yourself in their situation right now. The, the shepherds are out in a field nearby. It's night. It's dark. They're on the outskirts of Bethlehem, which Bethlehem is on the outskirts of nowhere because it's a town way off the beaten path. Nobody cares about Bethlehem. Nobody wants anything to do with Bethlehem. And yet even in Bethlehem, the shepherds aren't welcome. And so they're out in the fields keeping watch over their flock in the middle of the night. It's dark. And I would imagine if, if you're one of these shepherds, there's a, a little bit of despair that sets in, probably every night, where you feel like, man, this is just my lot in life. I'm unwanted. I'm unworthy. I'm not welcome. I'm an outsider. And, and this is how I'm going to spend the rest of my life. There's got to be a little bit of hopelessness there. And in the middle of that hopelessness, in the middle of the darkness of the night, an angel shows up, and it's got to be so bright so much so that, that they're so disturbed and distracted that the first thing he has to say to them is, do not be afraid. And then from there, he tells them this good news that this, this Savior has come, and it's good news for all people. And if you're one of those shepherds, you probably are still thinking like, hey, that's great for everybody else, everybody but me. And then a whole host of other angels show up and, and they start singing this song together. Glory to God in the highest heaven and on earth peace on those whom his favor rests. They get the most amazing worship experience anybody has ever witnessed. I, I got to think it's got to sound a little bit like City Church's worship service on a Sunday morning. Like it's just got to be up there, right? 
Like just amazing. Was that a, did you hit the, was that a note over here? Somebody just hit the note? We got a future worship leader back there. I like that. And so they're, they're experiencing, that. like the angels are showing up and singing to them, shepherds. In the darkest of nights, the light shows up. And then they're told, like, you've, you've got to go and see this. You, you've got to go and see this Savior. He's, and I, lo- I love what, what he says. This will be a sign to you. You will find a baby wrapped in cloths and lying in a manger. See, I, I wonder if one of the reasons why Jesus had to come this way was because if he would have been born in a palace, even if angels would have showed up, spoken to the shepherds, there would have been some major hesitation on their part. I can't go to the palace. I'm not welcome there. And even if they would have tried, there might have been some interference. But we're in Bethlehem. Nobody cares about Bethlehem. And he's in a manger. Like we, we may not be welcomed into somebody's house, but we can go see this baby lying in a manger. And so they do. They hurried off. They found Mary, Joseph, and the baby. And then it says, verse 17, when they saw him, they spread the word concerning what had been told about this child, and all who heard it were amazed at what the shepherds said to them. Again, here's why I believe this story is true. If you're going to make up a story, and you're going to make up eyewitnesses, you're probably not going to call them shepherds, because nobody believed their testimony in the first place. The only reason why you would say that the shepherds were the ones who witnessed this and then told everybody about it is if it were true, if that's actually how it happened. Like I can imagine Luke as he's under the inspiration of the Holy Spirit, you know, he's, he's collected all of this information, he's gathered it all, he's getting ready to write, he's got all these eyewitness testimonies, these accounts, and I can imagine there's probably some hesitation when he's like, really God, like you want me to write the part about the shepherds? Like you want me to tell them they were the first ones to see it? Like that's it? I don't know if anybody's going to believe this. But that's how it happened. That's how it unfolded. God chose the unlikeliest of people. Like, like, think about this. The first people invited to Christmas were the people that everybody else would have said were the least deserving to receive the invite. This is good news of great joy for all people. For all people. All right, one more text. We've got the lights on today, so we're just going to get as much Bible as we can. Matthew chapter 2. Matthew chapter 2. After Jesus, this is starting at verse 1, after Jesus was born in Bethlehem in Judea, during the time of King Herod, Magi from the east came to Jerusalem and asked, where is the one who has been born king of the Jews? We saw his star when it rose and have come to worship him. Did you catch that? We saw his star. And we have come to worship him. When King Herod heard this, he was disturbed, and all Jerusalem with him. When he had called together all the people's chief priests and teachers of the law, he asked them where the Messiah was to be born. So King Herod here, he's trying to understand. So he goes and grabs all the biggest, brightest religious superstars he could find, all the scholars and teachers of the law, and says, hey, tell me, what does your law say about this coming Messiah? Where was he supposed to be born? And they all in unison agreed, verse 5, in Bethlehem and Judea, they replied, for this is what the prophet has written. And this is the prophet Micah who wrote in verse 6 here, but you, Bethlehem, in the land of Judah are by no means least among the rulers of Judah. For out of you will come a ruler who will shepherd my people Israel. So they all knew this is where the Messiah was supposed to be born. Verse 7, Then Herod called the Magi secretly and found out from them the exact time the star had appeared. He sent them to Bethlehem and said, Go and search carefully for the child. As soon as you find him, report to me, so that I too may go and worship him. After they had heard the king, they went on their way, and the star they had seen when it rose, listen to this, the star they had seen when it rose went ahead of them until it stopped over the place where the child was. When they saw the star, they were overjoyed. On coming to the house, they saw the child with his mother Mary, and they bowed down and worshipped him. Then they opened their treasures and presented him with gifts of gold, frankincense, and myrrh. And having been warned in a dream not to go back to Herod, they returned to their country by another route. Again, one of my favorite things about the birth of Christ, one of my favorite things about God sending his son into the world is that he came into the world for everyone, for 
everyone. The magi here couldn't have been any more different from the shepherds. The shepherds, think about it, the shepherds at the birth of Christ were nearby. They were nearby in Bethlehem. The Magi were far off. Actually, we, we don't know how far off. We know that they came from a far distance away. We know that they, they uh, most likely would have traveled maybe even weeks or, or up to months to come and find Jesus. And, and that it was somewhere probably between six months and two years of Jesus' life when they showed up. So they came significantly later than the shepherds. The shepherds were nearby. They were far off. The shepherds were also Jewish. The Magi would have been Gentiles pagans. They, they, didn't, they didn't know this God. They didn't worship this God. We don't know a whole lot about them. We know that, you know, sometimes we call them wise men. Sometimes we call them kings. But, but we know that they wouldn't have necessarily worshiped this God. And, and so much so that the, the way that they found him was by looking at the stars. I mean, like, like incorporating whatever kind of Eastern religions they, they may have had in their, in their day. And, and maybe some of them might have even been considered astrologers. They were looking up into the heavens. And I love that God used something that they could connect with because at the end of the day, God is the one who created the stars. And so why wouldn't he have authority and dominion over those stars to draw people to his son, Jesus? And so the star rose bright in the darkest of nights. And then it led them to Jesus. The shepherds were Jewish. The Magi were Gentiles. The shepherds were as regular, regular Joes as you can imagine. And the Magi were, were royals of some kind. Wise men. They were well respected. Most likely they actually traveled in, in a very large caravan of people, a large group of people that would have come along with them on the journey. They were significant. They were important. It may, may have been kings. We don't know. But, but what we do know is they were important enough to, to get an audience with King Herod. And we also know that they were wealthy enough to come with these incredible gifts. They opened up their treasures and they just gave these gifts to King Jesus of gold, frankincense, and myrrh. They were completely opposite, like as far apart from the shepherds as you can imagine. And I think that's intentional. I think God was up to something here when he was drawing these two very different types of people to come see the birth of Christ because the birth of Christ is good news of great joy for all people, all people. Rich, poor, young, old, wealthy, not, it doesn't matter. Like, it, it, no matter what your status is, it doesn't matter. Jew, Gentile, you're all welcome when Jesus shows up. It's for everybody. Everybody was invited. And God brought this, this light into the darkness. But I, I want you to think about this. For, for both of the shepherds and the magi, they experience light in different ways. They experience light in the darkness, but the purpose of, of the light that they experienced was to actually lead them to the one true light, which was Jesus. It wasn't just to witness the, the light in the sky, but it was to lead them to their Savior and Messiah. God has an incredible way of using light in the darkness to lead us to Jesus. All of us. All of us. You know, there's, there's actually a, a song that was written in the uh, mid-1800s that describes this experience. It's actually written, the, the uh, first verse describes uh, the shepherds. There's actually a, another verse that describes the experience of the Magi. And, and then at the end of the song, it, it describes uh, how God is continually bringing light into the darkness, even into our world today, and how Jesus is the one true light in our lives. It's this song titled, O Holy Night. And it's a song that Christians have sung now for a couple hundred years. It's a beautiful song, really powerful song. And so I, I, as, as we sing the song, I want to invite you here to just sit and reflect. And I want you to actually picture yourself. I want you to imagine yourself being in the situation of the shepherds. Imagine yourself being in the shoes of the magi. And I just want you to imagine like, like, like living in darkness and then seeing a great light. And then that light leading you to the greatest light of all, which is Jesus. And then having the opportunity to actually worship at his feet. To encounter him firsthand. And I also want to invite you to consider how God has shown his light into the darkest areas of your life. See, every single one of us, we're, we're messy. Every single one of us 
have a past. Every single one of us have sin. Every single one of us have brokenness. Every single one of us have heartache and loss and hardship in our lives. And God shines his light brightest right into those dark places. And when he does that, he leads us to Jesus. So I want to encourage you to consider how he has done that in your life. And, And if he hasn't done it yet, I want to invite you to consider how he could do that for you today. So I want to invite you to listen to these lyrics, then I'll come back up and wrap us up, and then we'll light the candles and sing Silent Night together.